subject this morning is um, the Lion of the Faith is Reinhard Bonnke. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, we have a great chapter of the things that were done by faith and the men and the women of faith that God used. And currently, we're looking at lions of the faith. In chapter 12 of Hebrews, it talks about this innumerable company of witnesses that we are surrounded by. And uh, these men of faith that have gone on, some of the men of faith uh, that we've listened to, and women, they're now in heaven. I am glad this morning that Reinhard Bonk is still alive. He's 76 years old, but he's still alive. And um, he's still serving the Lord today. I think, friends, alongside Billy Graham, he has been the greatest evangelist this world has ever seen. <laughs> Billy Graham blazed a trail for God in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And uh, Reinhard Bonnke, from 19... 1967 when he went to Africa and uh, has blazed a trail for God and millions of people have found Jesus. I think the only difference between Reinhard Bonnke and Billy Graham is it, Billy Graham has tended just to preach the message of salvation where Bonnke has preached the message of salvation with signs following and seen phenomenal miracles taking place. The dead being raised, the the, the power of God getting people out of wheelchairs and just phenomenal things that have taken place under his life and his ministry. And it's my privilege this morning to be able to share with you some of the life, not all of it, but some of the life of Reinhard Bonk. And I really believe the Holy Spirit will speak to us today. I looked at some of his quotes some of the things that he said in his ministry. I just want to read a few of you to, 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 to you before we start. The less Holy Spirit we have, the more cake and coffee we need to keep the church going. God always works with workers and moves with movers, but he does not sit with sitters. The gospel is good news, not good history. When it's preached... It happens. When you do business with people, you need money. When you do business with God, you need faith. Faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. Anyone can believe when God is already moving, but real faith is when you step out when it seems that God is not moving. I think we want people to step out, don't you? I think we, we need to step out. If you are doing nothing, God doesn't need to give you any help in doing nothing. Go out and do something impossible for Jesus, and then you will find that God will help you. Christianity boring? So is the TV, if it's not plugged in. Jesus will lift you out of the deepest pit but he will not lift you out of your easy chair. If you want to catch fish, don't throw your nets into the bathtub. The gospel is a gospel of power, or it is nothing at all. Let me read you a little bit of a profile. Evangelist Reinhard Bonk is principally known for his great gospel crusades throughout the continent of Africa. He's the son of a pastor, and Reinhard gave his life to the Lord at the age of nine, and he heard the call to the African mission field where, when, where, before he was a teenager. After attending Bible college in Wales and his ordination in Germany, he pastored a church and then went on to start missionary work in Africa. It was there in the small mountain kingdom of Lesotho that God placed upon his heart the vision of the continent of Africa being washed in the precious blood of Jesus and an entire continent from Cape Town to Cairo, from Dakar to Djibouti that needed to be reached and to hear the proclamation of the signs following gospel. 
He began holding meetings in a tent that accommodated just 800 people. But as attendance steadily increased, larger and larger tents had to be purchased. Until finally, in 1984, he commissioned this construction of the world's largest mobile structure, a tent capable of seating 34,000 people. Soon, attendance at his meetings even exceeded the capacity of this huge structure, and he began open-air gospel campaigns with initial gatherings of over 150,000 people per service. Since then, he has conducted citywide meetings across the continent with as many as 1,600,000 people attending a single meeting. Wow. 1,600,000 people in one meeting. It has, it has now been some 35 years since Reinhard Bonnke founded the International Ministry of Christ for All Nations, CFAN, which currently has offices in the United States, Canada, Germany, the UK, Nigeria, South Africa, Singapore, Australia, and on Hong Kong. Since the start of the new millennium, through a host of major events in Africa and other parts of the world, the ministry has recorded 75 million documented decisions for Jesus Christ. As part of his discipleship program, 185 million copies of CFAN follow-up literature has been published in 103 languages and printed in 55 countries. Millions of books have been printed and freely, and, and freely seeded in nations all around the world. All this is in addition to the Bo School of Ministry or the School of Fire that Reinhard Bonnke um, set up an online self-study course aimed at inspiring others to Holy Spirit evangelism and leading to either a certificate or university credits. Reinhard Bonk is also recognized for hosting fire conferences in many different countries of the world, events that are aimed at equipping church leaders and workers for evangelism, for distributing over 95,000, 95 million sorry, 95 million, 500,000 copies of Minus to Plus, a profound salvation message to homes around the world and for seeking every opportunity to reach and serve the lost. He is known with a burning passion for the gospel, a vision for Africa, and a message for the world. I, I, I think I, what I want us to do now is just have a look at a video. Um, what you're going to see is perhaps the greatest Christmas gathering of souls. This big city and then just, just can you, not, that's not the video, guys, that's the wrong one. It's the other video. Um, the vast amount of souls that you're going to see on this video, I want you to look at the numbers who are being saved. Nigeria was closed for the gospel. Anyhow, let's just have a look at this.
tonight you may come here as weak as can be you will go home like a conqueror with Jesus inside of you Inspiring. God, do it again. Do it in our nation, eh? That was in one nation, Nigeria. One nation. And uh, that vast sea of humanity coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God, visit our nation like that. That is the outcome of what I'm going to share with you this morning about the hand of God upon. A man called Reinhard Bonnke and uh, what, what I want to do this morning friends is really pick up on his early life from when he was nine to when he was about 21 and uh, I'll be reading some extracts from his own autobiography so they're his own words and I've been challenged and blessed and built up in my faith as I've just soak myself in the word and in, in the life of this man who we're looking at this morning. There's several areas I want us to look at this morning. I want us to look at his conversion, his call, his equipping, his commissioning, 
and the harvest. And I really believe God is going to, to speak to us this morning. Reinhardt was born on April the 19th in 1940 in a town called Wickeden in Germany. There were six children in the Bonk family, family, five boys and one girl. Reinhardt was the, the, not the last born, he was the last, the, the next to the last who was born into the family. So he was the second youngest. When war was nearing the end in 1945, with his family, with his mother and children, he, he fled Germany. And for four years, he was in a refugee camp in Denmark before he returned to Germany in 1949. Reinhard describes his childhood and he talks about his mother as being the disciplinarian of the family. She was the one who wouldn't spare the rod or would sp wouldn't spare the rod and, what was this? Spare the rod and spoil the child. She, he writes, to run foul of her was to risk a good hiding, as she often called it. Somehow, he says, I earned more than my share of hidings. I might run off to play with a friend and forget to ask permission, or I might express an opinion totally contrary to my mother's rules as if I had every perfect right to do so. I would be distracted while carrying firewood home and end up playing soccer. At, me at meal times, I might begin wrestling with a sibling, spill my food and drink. There seemed no end to the ways that I could get into trouble. It got so that in the morning, my mother would look at me and say, you naughty boy, I might as well give you a good hiding now and get it over with. And he says, she meant it. <laughs> he said, I was a naughty boy. I was an extremely naughty boy. No matter how many times I was corrected, it seemed as though I never learned my lesson. At the age of nine, he was once again in trouble. He had been stealing money from his mother's wallet not a lot, just a little bit, enough to go down to the town and buy some chocolate. And uh, one day she caught him red-handed in the jar where her wallet was. And uh, he, he writes this. She said to him, Do you not know, Reinhardt, that it says in the Bible, you shall not steal? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Reinhardt said, I knew that by heart. When we break God's law, she said, it's sin. Reinhardt, you are a sinner. And I'm worried about you because sinners go to hell for all eternity. He writes, the pain of my transgression grew heavy indeed. She went on, do you know that that is why Christ died on the cross? I had never thought of his death as applying strictly to me. In church and in family devotions, when we heard about it, I had always thought of the sins of the whole world as causing the death of the Son of God. Suddenly, my own sins were before me, slashing like a cat of nine tails into the flesh of the Lamb of God, and I began to cry. Jesus died to save sinners, Reinhardt. He died so that you would not have to go to hell for your sins. Would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior and be forgiven? Oh yes, Mama, I would. In truth, I felt that awful reality of being lost. This was more than a life lesson. It was an eternal life lesson. It was one that marked me for the rest of my life and ministry. I repeated a prayer after her, acknowledging that I was a sinner and accepting Jesus as my Savior. When we finished, she hugged me. It was a birthday hug and more. It was my new birthday. I felt as if a thousand pound weight had been lifted from my shoulders. It was the last time in my life that I ever stole anything. Can you remember how you felt when you were saved? Sometimes the, the, it's good to remember, friends. It's good to remember the, the, the rock or the pit from where God's lifted us from. 
we need to keep going back to that place when we recognized we were sinners and we needed a savior. There is something else, she went on, Reinar, that the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth, you will be saved. Do you believe that, that you have been saved? Yes, mother, he said, I do. If you have believed it, then you need to confess it. Sunday, when we're at church, I want you to stand up and confess to the other believers what has happened here today. Will you do that? I was happy to say yes, I, and I did it. And the moment I confessed Jesus Christ as my Savior, it sealed my conversion. Let me say something, friends, very important here. I really believe that God is going to use us, every one of us, to win people for Jesus Christ. It's already happening. But can I encourage us all, when people are won for Christ, let's not just get them to believe in their hearts. Let's make it vitally important that they confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus Christ. I can always remember Steve telling me that when he was at work, he believed in his heart, but he'd never confessed Jesus with his mouth, and he never felt saved. Until one day in the garage, was it at Richmond or Darlington? Okay. Richmond. One day, he nailed his colors to the mask, and he confessed Jesus. He told people he'd become a Christian. It's important that we make or encourage new believers to confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus. Amen? If they're one outside of the church, get them. He said, when I, con Reinhard Bonk, he said, when I confessed Jesus as my Savior amongst that group of people on the Sunday after I'd given my heart to the Lord, he said, I felt connected to the church. I felt connected to the body of Christ. He was connected to the family of God. And can I just encourage us all to make this, when we win, lead people to the Lord Jesus, stress the importance of confessing with their mouths. And even if they've got to come here on a Sunday to do it, praise God, or wherever they do it, let them confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus. Not long after... Reinhard Bonk's conversion. He said, I attended a life-changing service. On this particular day, a husband and wife missionary team had been invited to speak. I, I do not rem remember much about them or even what they talked about because as they were speaking, the Spirit of God spoke to me in my heart. It was, uh, it was as if he said very clearly, Reinhard, one day you will preach my gospel in Africa. It was as if Africa had suddenly been written on my heart. Later, after the service had finished, I shared it with my father. Father, God has spoke to me in church today, and he said that I must, must preach the gospel in Africa. I must have appeared to him like a bouncing puppy, yapping out of excitement. He didn't seem to understand. He dismounted from his bicycle and he asked me to repeat what I just said. Then he looked at me with a puzzled and a somber expression. Your brother Martin will be my heir, Reinhardt. He will be the preacher of the gospel in this family. It was like a shower of cold water. But Father, God has called me to preach in Africa. He scowled. How do you know that, that God has called you? He said, disappointment darkened my young heart. His tone of voice spoke louder than his words. It told me he was in deep doubt about my call. Although his earthly father doubted, Reinhard knew in his heart from that day that he had heard the voice of his heavenly father. In the months that followed, he said, I brought it up again and again. And each time my father responded in the same way, he doubted me and quizzed me about how I could know the voice of God. Each time I had to deal with my deep disappointment and a gulf began to grow between us. Father, I asked one day, since you do not believe that I have a real call from God, 
how do you know when you have a real one? How does it feel? I think he was surprised by my question. He thought for a while, then he said, Son, when you have a real call from God, then you will know it. You will know it deep in your heart. You will know it, and it will never be shaken. Every word that he said rang true in my heart, confirming my call from God. Father, I shouted, I know that I know that I have a real call from God. The look on his face told me he was not comfortable to hear such confidence coming from the mouth of a child. I am happy to add that many years later, when he visited me in Africa, this conversation between us about my calling became one of his favorite stories to tell. Let me tell you, friends, you don't have to have the accommodation of men to know when God's called you. You know when God calls you. He said he would talk from the pulpit with his eyes shining with tears as he confessed with great sorrow how wrong he had been in his judgment of me, a 10-year-old boy. Reinhardt refers to himself as the least, or, or the, what, what did he say? The next to the last. He said if I'd been last, he said that would have had some significance. But he said I wasn't even last in the family. I was next to the last. And everybody in the family, it seemed as though Reinhard, because of his mischievousness and his getting into trouble, he was always, always in bother. And it seemed as though none of the family took him seriously. But after this conversion experience, there was a real hunger for God that was lit in his life. During my 11th year, he said, I began to ask my mother if I could go to the Friday night prayer meeting. And again and again, she denied my request. In my heart, I was sure I was being denied because I was unworthy. All the years of misbehavior and self-will had disqualified me to be in the presence of God's people. To make up for it, I would do my chores all week and even do extra chores on a Friday, trying to make a change of mind. Still, she said no. Week after week, it went on like this. I grew more and more disappointed, blaming myself for all of it. Finally, one day, she said no, and I couldn't hide my pain. Tears spilled from my eyes. Mother, she was taken aback. She sat down astonished. She gazed at me as if she had not seen me before. What is this I am seeing, she asked, a boy of 11 who wants to attend the prayer meeting so badly that he sheds tears. Your heart must be ready to be part of these things. I sense the Lord is telling me I must change my answer to yes. I leapt up and hugged her. Thank you, Mother. I do want to go more than anything. From that day, I began to attend every church service, not just on a Sunday, would every service during the week and others beside. He had a hunger for God. You know, when I read that, friends, I thought, how much hunger have we got for God? The Bible says there that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. You know, when you get hungry, you feed yourself. It's what we feed ourselves on. What are we feeding ourselves on as believers, friends? Is there that hunger for God? At one time, people used to make excuses to get to the meetings. Now people make excuses to stop away or trying to find as many excuses to stop away. There was a hunger for God in this young boy's life. I can remember when I got saved in Bishop Auckland. I, I worked at North Bitchburn, not far from Bishop Auckland. And I used to occasionally have to go down to the uh, factors in the town to get some supplies to take back to where I worked. And, and, and I can remember as a, a, a young fella of 19 years of age, just wanting to be in the presence of God. And, and I can remember walking around the building of the church. Nothing on, the place was closed up, but in my heart, God had lit a hunger for God. Friends, we need to have a hunger for God. 
And you know, I've been challenged afresh. How hungry are we for God? You know, we've got a revive weekend coming up. How hungry are we for God? How hungry are we? How much do we want to see God do something? May God give us a hunger. One weekday evening, he said, at the end of one of the prayer meetings, I was standing beside my mother and father, and the pastor made an announcement that Grandma Bozusus, an elderly lady in the congregation, had received a vision. On his invitation, she stood and related her vision to the members of our little group. She said, I saw a crowd of black people. It was a very large crowd. They were gathered in a semicircle around a little boy with a big loaf of bread. He was breaking the bread and he was giving it to the people. And as he did, the loaf of bread continued to increase. Then she turned to me and pointed, the little boy that I saw in the vision is this one. I cannot adequately tell you what happens inside a boy when something like this occurs. It was like the pouring of hot, hot oil over my head, anointing me to see the vision for God confirmed and fulfilled in my life. Yet in that hour, neither I nor father or mother could even faintly imagine just how powerfully this vision would eventually play out. We've seen some of it on there. A little boy feeding the multitudes. My father, he looked at me incredulously. I think for the first time he began to get a glimpse that, pra that perhaps I had actually heard from God. The Bible says you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Reinhard describes a day when he was 11 years of age that he describes as the first day of the rest of his life. He said, it happened in 1951. I was 11 years old. The day I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. A special speaker visited the church from Finland. His name was Pastor Arthur Kukola. And he was well known for leading people in receiving this gift. Rather than have a seekers meeting in the main hall, believers decided, uh, sorry, I can't read my own writing. The local believers decided to have him come to a smaller gathering held in a home in the rural countryside. He said, I had been to that house many times for dinner after church. It was one of my favorite places on earth. Reinhard, you said that you wanted the baptism in the Spirit just like your mother. Why don't you go with me to this meeting? I was shocked that my father was asking me to go. There was opposition from my mother. He's not ready yet, she said. But my father persisted. If he wants to go, let him go. As soon as I entered the room with those saints, I felt something begin to tingle inside of me. Incredibly, it was a growing expectation that I would receive the gift of the baptism of the Spirit that evening. As Arthur Kakala spoke, my faith leapt up and shouted yes within me. The words of Scripture seemed to come alive in my chest. When Arthur invited those seeking the Holy Spirit to kneel in prayer, I did so immediately. No sooner had I reached my knees than I was overwhelmed with an incredible sensation. No one needed to lay hands on me to pray. I received the gift of speaking in tongues spontaneously and burst out in heavenly language. It seemed to come from beyond me and from within me at the same time. At the age of 11, the spirit baptism began to lead me on an adventure of faith that has not ended. I literally took off like a rocket ship and no one could stop me. I continued to be empowered by it to this very day. He writes, I know many people, yes, even Pentecostal believers, who have encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, yet have returned to lead lives of quiet desperation. Reinhard Bonk is not one of them. 
My life is filled with challenges, yet it is also full of passion, meaning, joy, enthusiasm, peace, and blessing. I did not produce these wonderful things. These are fruits that flow from an intimate relationship with my Heavenly Father. Friends, can I say this morning, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for every born-again believer. It is not an optional extra. It is absolutely essential. I cannot stress the importance of the baptism in the Holy Spirit enough. I, I want to ask two biblical questions this morning. And the first one is this. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And today, if you are here and you are a born-again Christian, you've accepted Jesus, but you have not yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, can I encourage you? This is not just for other people. It's for you. And the Bible says when you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I want to encourage every believer here this morning who's not been filled with the Holy Spirit to seek God, to hunger for God. The Bible says if we thirst for God, if you, we hunger and thirst, we shall be filled. And if we ask for the Holy Spirit, begin to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And the second question is to us, all of us, who have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Is there a need this morning in our hearts to stir up the gift of God which is within us? Is there a need to fan into flame this mighty baptism that we receive from the Almighty for works of service? Do we need to fan it into flame? Note what Reinhard Bonnke said. He said, I know of many Pentecostal believers who have encountered the power of the Holy Spirit yet I've returned to lead lives of quiet desperation. Friends, God wants, He's filled us with fire. And He doesn't want the fire to go out. He wants the fire to burn continually in our hearts. And I know I'm a man of, in the flesh just like you. And I know that at times the fire gets dull inside. And the Word of God says we've got to stir up the gift of God. We've got to fan it into flame. Hallelujah. Friends, God every day of our lives wants to fan into flame this mighty baptism in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. It'll change our lives when we are filled with the Holy Ghost because He's the answer that we're looking for. And let me say, friends, when we're filled with Him, we're filled with nothing. We can be filled with nothing else. It's because we're filled with so much of other stuff that we, 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 we haven't got room for the Holy Ghost in, in our lives. What was it, Reinhard Bonk? He said, the less Holy Spirit we have, the more cake and coffee we need to keep the church going. Friends, we haven't been called to cake and coffee. We've been called to reach a world for Jesus Christ. We've been called to, to win the nations for God. Through his teenage years, not only Reinhard, but others recognized the anointing and the hand of God upon his life. They became very conscious of his call to the ministry. He began to preach, first of all, in the youth meetings in the church. Then he would go out with his guitar and preach and sing in the open air, sometimes by himself, just to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then other churches began to invite him to to go and preach in their churches. One day, Reinhardt's father, who had always been skeptical of him, heard him preaching. At the end of the message, he said, where did you get that message from? To which Reinhard Bonnke replied, the Bible. He preached the word. In 1959, he was accepted to the Bible College of Wales in Swansea. And during his two years there, at the age where he went when he was 19 years of age. And during his two years there, God confirmed his call upon his life to be an evangelist. He said it happened one day in the Bible college 
when they were all saying what God, and God put it in his heart that you are an evangelist. So he said, from that day on, whenever people asked me, what is your ministry? He said, I am an evangelist for Jesus Christ. He graduated at the age of 21. And after leaving the college and making his way back to Germany, he had an opportunity to visit London prior to getting on the boat to go back to, to Germany. And he decided to take an unguided sightseeing tour of the great city. And so he said, I went from bus to bus, crisscrossing the great capital. And it was whilst he was here in London that he had a very remarkable experience that I just want to, you to have a look at it on the video. Thanks, Guy. From bus to bus, I just went crisscrossing this big city and then arriving here at Clapham Common. I thought I had now been driving for hours and I needed to stretch my legs walking through these beautiful streets. All of a sudden, I saw a blue nameplate in front of a house. It read George Jeffries. I thought by myself, can it be that this is the George Jeffries who was that firebrand evangelist and who traveled through Britain years ago preaching the gospel with signs and wonders? Can it be? Well, I had time enough. Why not find out? I walked through the front garden, pushed the button of the bell, a lady opened. I said, ma'am, does the George Jeffries live here who was that firebrand evangelist? She said to me, yes. I said, may I please see him? She said, no, under no circumstances. She had hardly said no when I heard a deep voice from the inside. Let him come in. I squeezed past that lady inside and there I saw him coming down the steps. I introduced myself. I told them that I had the call of God on my life to preach the gospel in Africa. All of a sudden, he fell to the ground, pulling me down with him. He laid his hands on me and started to bless and bless and bless me. The glory of the Lord appeared. I was dazed by that glory. Half an hour later, I got up. I staggered to the bus stop, going to the railway station, catching the train back home to Hamburg. My father greeted me there. We just had a little conversation and then dad said, Reinhard, I just heard the news that George Jeffries died in London. I said, what? I can't believe it. It's impossible. I just met him. But it was the truth. Then I realized something wonderful had happened. I had caught Elijah's mantle. That day God connected me with the former generations of evangelists. The gospel is like a baton in a relay race. That day I got that baton into my hands. The fire I had already. The fire is always fresh. The baton of the gospel is always old and it is passed on. I knew that day the baton and the flame had met. I feel, friends, that this is basically what the Lord has just laid on my heart to finish with this morning about this baton of the gospel being passed on. In 1 Corinthians, we read these words, You see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Thank you, God. God. 
God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. I can't see the words. To put to shame the, the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world. To put to shame the things which are mighty. And the best things of the world. And the things which are despised. God has chosen. And the things which are not. To bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You might say, I'm not a Reinhard Bonnke. I'm not a Dietrich Bonhoeffer that we heard about, or a George Muller, or any other of these giants of the faith that we, we're looking at. That might be true, you're not. And I'm not. But the good news is God doesn't want us to be. He wants us to be us. He wants us to be you. Hallelujah. Friends, he saved you. And he called you. And the same call, the same commission that was on these great men of faith's lives can I say this morning, and I want you to listen to this, it is on your life too. God is no respecter of per people. The same call, the same commission is on our lives. Friends, you have been chosen by God. You have been handpicked by the Almighty. God has chosen you. Not the person sitting next to you, or in front of you, or behind you. He's chosen you. My Bible tells me you did not choose God, but God chose you. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we're at our worst, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, went to the cross and he died for us. And friends, the word of God tells me that this happened before the world was ever created. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Before the world was ever created, God knew there would be a Cliff Henderson. God knew there would be a Richard Lyons and a Stephen Marwood. God knew that there would be a you. And the Bible says before the world was ever created, he called you. And he knew that when he called you, you would respond to it. For those he foreknew, them also he called and predestined to become the heirs of the kingdom and the Son of God. Friends, God had his hand upon us Long before we were in the womb, God had his hand upon us before the world was ever created. And before the world was ever created, before our bones were formed in the womb, Psalm 91 says, he knew all of our days and he numbered them. Hallelujah. Every single one of them before we were ever born. Not only has he chosen us, he's called us. Chosen by God. Can you remember when you used to be chosen to do something? How proud you felt? I remember standing in a, a line at school when they used to pick the football team. You remember? And they used to call your name out. Boy, you weren't that proud. You weren't that pleased that you'd been chosen. Or you were chosen to do something in class. Beyond all the others in the class, you'd been chosen. Friends, we have been chosen by the Almighty. He himself has chosen us. And the Bible says he has called us. He has called us. Many are called. Only a few are chosen. 
Can I say today that there is not one person in the entire world that is not called? For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. The whole world is called men and women out of every tribe, clime, and nation. The billions, this vast sea of humanity, God has called everyone. But not everyone has received the call. Not everyone has responded to the call. But we are sitting here, most of us this morning, because we responded to the call. When the call came, come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And deep down like Reinhard did, we heard the voice of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We recognized we were sinners. We responded to the call. And a miracle happened that the Bible calls the new birth. Hallelujah. And we were born again. Hallelujah. Friends, many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus said, don't rejoice because the devils are subject unto you. Rather rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank God our names are in the book of life this morning. What a privileged people we are, friends. What a privilege it is. Chosen and called by Almighty God. Can I say this morning, it was for a purpose. God never does it randomly. You were saved for a purpose. And the purpose why God saved you is the same purpose why God saved Reinhard Bonk and the same pur purpose that God saved the Apostle Paul and the same purpose right, running right across this congregation this morning, every one of us was saved with the same purpose. That we might win others for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. He said to Peter, all your life, Peter, you've caught fish. But he said, from now on, you are going to catch men. And I want to tell you, friends, this morning, without a shadow of doubt, that the reason God has saved and called you and brought you to himself is that you might win people for Jesus Christ. That you might become his witness. Thank God we can be true Jehovah's Witnesses. Just thought of that, this, you know. We have Jehovah's Witnesses knocking at the door. Every Christian can become a true Jehovah's Witness. Hallelujah. A witness for Christ. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, Jesus said, you shall become my witnesses. What a privilege to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's expressed desire for every one of us is that we might be his witnesses. His witnesses. Not only has he called us and chosen us, but he's also sent us, friends. He sent, we are sent ones. Every one of us here this morning, we are sent ones. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, even so, send I you. You have received a commission from the Lord himself. Church didn't do it. A leader, a pastor, some anointed preacher didn't do it. The commission that you have received is direct from God. Go into all the world. Go. I'm sending you. The Bible says if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost. How are they going to believe in him who they've never heard about? And how are they going to hear about him unless someone goes and tells them? Jesus says, even so, I'm sending you to tell them to go. 
We had a tremendous night on Thursday night when Luke shared with us about evangelism. Gives that great introduction and time's gone and we haven't got time to go into it today. But there was some great stuff in there. But the baton of the gospel is being passed on to us. The question is, are we running with it? Or have we dropped it? Four leprous men lived in Samaria. Samaria had been invaded by the Syrians. The invasion had caused great crisis in the city. The Bible says nobody could go out and nobody could come in. They had blocked the city off. Food had become scarce. In fact, food had become so scarce that my Bible tells me that they were get, eating the, the droppings from the, the, the doves, you know, the, the bird droppings, and selling them. There was even cannibalism in the city. And there was no answer. The city was locked up. And one day, these four leprous men stood at the gate of Samaria with the doors closely shut, and they said, if we stop here, we're going to die. But if we go and give ourselves into the hands of the Syrians, the chances are they might kill us, but we, we're going to die if we stop here. So they decided to go. That night, God had worked a miracle because the Syrian army, and we haven't got time to go into the whole story, but the prophet had said that things were going to change and nobody believed him. And that night, God had sent the armies of heaven and the Syrian army had heard this great army coming against them and they had fled, leaving their tents with all their gold and their silver, with all the goods that they had plundered on their journey to, to, to Samaria, left the lot and they had fled. Little, these four leprous men went out of the gate and they began to walk towards the camp of the Syrians and when they got there, they, it seemed deathly quiet and they couldn't understand it. And there was nobody in the camp. It was deserted. And along the road, as, the, as they were looking beyond the road, they, they saw garments being on the floor and things just left in, as people had run in panic. And they went into one tent and saw the tent just intact and saw the gold and the silver and food upon the table. And they began to go into other tents and it was exactly the same. The, 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 there was abundance of stuff. And they began to sit down and eat and drink to their heart's content. They put on beautiful garments and beautiful robes. They got gold bars and silver bars and they, they dug them into the ground and hid them. And they were having a whale of a time. Until one of them said, guys, what we're doing, it's not right. If we keep this to ourselves, the whole city, thousands of people, they're going to die. It's up to us to go and tell them. We do not well this day. This is a day of glad tidings, and we are holding our peace. So the story goes in the Bible that they went and told the whole city what had happened. And they came out in their thousands. And as a result of them telling, a city was saved. Had they kept silent that day and kept it to themselves, people would have been lost. Paul says, if our gospel is hidden, if we never tell it, it is hidden to those who are lost. I thank God, friends, he has given us something to go with. He's given us the gospel. Go and preach the gospel, the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God today is putting the baton of the gospel in the hands of believers, every believer, when you were saved, he put a button in your hand with a message for you to carry to the, to, the, to the lost people of this world, to the workers in your workplace, 
to the neighborhood where you live. God gave you a commission to go and sent you with the gospel. Today, friends, he, I, I do believe for many, I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ in general. Many have dropped the baton, forgot the purpose why we're running at all, why we're here at all, why we exist as a church. Why do we exist as a church? Just to have a nice time? We exist, friends, for those who are not yet here. Our biggest, peop our biggest membership is still out there. Hundreds and thousands of people. And in this room today, we represent thousands of people who need a saviour. Friends, God's not asking you or me to be Reinhard Bonnke. We might not have the gift of an evangelist. Reinhard Bonnke's obviously got the gift of an evangelist. We might not have the gift of an evangelist. But let me tell you, God wants us to do the work of an evangelist. God wants me and you to become, in his hands, the people who he has commissioned who will go with the gospel and let Jesus Christ be known. The Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. Let him know that he who converts a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover, hide a multitude of sin. Friends, there is the baton of the gospel that God has placed in our hands. And the challenge to every one of us today, to me, to you, is are we going to go with it? Are we going to run with it? Are we going to fulfill the reason Jesus Christ saved us in the first place? The purpose we were saved because he loved us and he loves men and women. And he wants none to perish but everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And friends, we can sit in our church seats all that we like. We can sit in our comfort zones all that we like. But I want to tell you, people are lost and they need a saviour. And I really believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us today, will we go? Whom will I send and who will go? A young boy heard the call of God in his heart. I pray this morning that we will all here reaffirm that call that's come to us to go with the gospel of our Lord and saviour.